They were horribly wretched things. My days usually begin and end with seeing them. The goners were located on the other side of the barbed wire as I walked by. Almost all these people have large sores in their bodies, missing teeth, glossy eyes, and a strange and inhuman appearance to their faces. They all stank worse than the normal prisoner, as they had no control over their own bowels and bladders. Their rotted teeth were drenched with excrement. Some of them were raving and wailing incoherently, while others were dazed and night-blind, arms stretched out as they continually bumped into everything in their pathways. A couple of them were not moving, bodies stiff along the cold ground, a clear indication that life had left them not too long ago. I had seen them for a couple months now, but it was difficult to get used to. What makes it even worse is the constant reminder that it could easily be your own fate at any time. I shudder and rub my arms for self-comfort, eagerly anticipating some soup. Well, not so much soup. It's some kind of mystery mush floating in salt water. Maybe if I'm incredibly lucky, I'll get a decent-sized piece of bread. I'm pretty sure I'm at my quota for the day. Well, I sort of cheated here and there, but so far none is the wiser. I hear my guards speak in their usual sharp and aggressive tone. I carefully line up behind the other women in my brigade, eyes blinking and growing exhaustion from the exceptionally long workday. Sixteen hours, and I still have two weeks away before I get my monthly Sunday off. I take a deep breath and let out a sigh. Just don't think about it. At least this morning we weren't made to undress and have our bodies be thoroughly investigated. The cook hands me a raggedy wooden bowl with liquid in chunks, a morsel of dry, dark bread, and a mug of water. There's no spoon. It was late in the evening, a bit too late for a conventional dinner time, but the command wanted us to keep going to cover some sort of... I don't know. We just needed to work a little extra today, and bypass our usual meal break. I was starving as usual, to say least. The food here is never enough to truly survive by. Unless, of course, you prove yourself to be an exceptional worker. But even then, the more successful you are, the more they think the quotas can be raised. It's a never-ending cycle. Even the strongest and most eager end up collapsing at some point. I nestle into my little area inside a very humble home. The other female convicts were on their way inside the barracks as well, the vast majority political prisoners like myself, shuffling into their officially owned territory. There was not a lot of space in our shack. We looked like chaotic sardines in a tin can. The bunk beds had at least three women each, and the floors had scattered human bodies everywhere in makeshift blankets. There was an attempt to be clean, but it was still filthy. There isn't a lot of options for toilets and washing. I take a sip of my soup carefully. At least we don't have to live with the men. Apparently their world was so much more rough and dangerous. Granted, this isn't the high life, but at least my comrades. I'm technically not allowed to use that title with others, as we ceased existing as proper comrades, but they can't control my head, now can they? We're decent enough girls and women. A lot of them arrived here for similar reasons as I. They were late to work too many times, they said something they shouldn't have, they were accused of being spies for such and such country, they were married or child of a well-known Rusty, visiting foreigners, etc. I said something negative about the Soviet system, and an acquaintance reported me. Lo and behold, after a month of interrogation, another month stuffed in a cattle car, here I am, located in this wasteland receiving ten years' punishment. All in all, we were enemies of the people, mentally and socially poisonous and dangerous, worse than rapists, robbers, murderers. Those were the physical crimes in comparison, as the state calls it. Thus, easier to rehabilitate and understand. We have less rights than they do in the camp world. NKVD can go fuck themselves. And Joseph. Some of my comrades were still infatuated or in denial, but I wasn't. I knew. The rest of the women in our population, though not as many in number, were prostitutes and thieves. Usually affiliated with the male gangs, the former were much lower in hierarchy than the latter. They usually kept to themselves. And I was fine with that, as I had no interest in indulging into their unique and incredibly harsh world. Though one must still be careful with thieves, they will obviously take your items from you. These days, socks, sweaters, utensils, everyday items, they were worth their weight in gold. I looked down at my empty bowl. Finished already? Ugh. I carefully scraped the bowl with my fingers, itching to get any little bit of soup that's still in the bowl. I stood up for my spot, deciding to head outside for a little bit. It was becoming stuffy in here, and despite already having fresh air all day, I just wanted to go back outside. Besides, with winters lasting ten months or so here, might as well take advantage of the reasonable weather. I step out and look around. There's some lighting here and there thanks to the odd bulb dangling on wires, but it was otherwise pretty dark. I can see the menacing towers in the distance where the night guards were watching over us. I can see some other women in the distance chatting with each other. 
Some of them were older women, some of them adolescents, others in between, wearing various shabby clothing as their main attire. Many of the clothes were leftovers of the day they got arrested, whereas the others had been given poorly fitted uniforms back during their interrogation days in a formal prison. Everyone had their hair tucked away, in under a scarf, and everyone looked equally pale and gaunt. They were talking about basic things, as one usually does in this environment. I joined in the conversations, discussing food, little details about the old life, who's in the punishment cell, who got pregnant, who died today, who were the lucky ones that became seamstresses or kitchen staff instead of loggers or miners, as it was guaranteed extra food, shelter, and privacy. Dark humor later comes in, a regular method of coping with a hellish circumstance. We really wanted to talk about other things, like politics, history, more details about the current events of the outside world, but that's much too risky. I suddenly hear this cry in the distance, followed by sharp, piercing laughter. The women glance around nervously, trying to find the direction of the sound. A few seconds later, the realization dawned on one of them. Oh no. Oh no! One of the women said, her face dripping with severe attention. What is that? What is it? As I say that, there was a banging sound echoing from the dark. We have to go. We have to go inside. Right now. My stomach sank. What's going on? Is it what I think it is? Male voices are heard, cat calling, followed by insulting commentary. It was faint, but still very powerful in their intentions and determination. We're coming for you. Horrors. Ready for some fun? I get it now. The organized criminal gangs, managing to successfully band together even in these dreaded labor camps. A reputation for being brutal and cruel, they are the prisoners associated with the purely so-called physical crimes. Trademark tattoos riddle their bodies, each individual mark signifying their own symbolic and sinister meanings. I've heard about this happening frequently. It's beyond the simple everyday notion of the occasional harassment or having informal camp husbands as protection. I was informed about the case of a hundred young girls being brutally attacked on a cargo ship by the thugs who broke down into the room, killing the good men that tried to protect them. Then there are the various accounts from other camps that women are often hunted by these criminals. For... I didn't hesitate and quickly follow the other women back into their building. Won't the guards stop them or something, I ask? Another woman snorted in response. They hardly ever intervene in these cases. We slam the door shut and proceed to look about to try and find something to barricade it with. It wasn't like our barracks was a mighty stone fortress, just a building containing old logs and rickety windows. In any case, it was worth the fight, and we managed to shove beds against the available doors. Next was the windows, which we tried to seal with planks of wood that were meant to be for a future fire. I was actually worried about the criminal women among us. What if they were working with the gangs during a moment like this? What if they helped them? I carefully glanced around at their faces, and they actually looked as worried as we were. One of them was starting to weep. I am reminded of the simple fact that even if they might be members, the criminals still view their own women as less than dirt. This was a surprise to them, different than being aware of something ahead of time. We waited. For about a minute, there was silence. Then the voices reappeared in the distance, laughing and shrieking. We do have a wall surrounding us, so they still have to go over that at least. Bang. 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 There were other shelters nearby, and I sincerely hoped that the other prisoners had taken some sort of measures to protect themselves. Bang. I slipped myself into a corner, taking long, deep breaths to calm myself down. Everyone here was as silent as I was, for obvious reasons. I rubbed my hands together, wanting to do some sort of spiritual reaction, but that was the sort of thing they also banned and targeted. I wasn't able to put together the words I wanted. What was it again? Deliver us from evil, something about bread, peace, and judging bad, dead people? Wait, I think I might be combining two different ones together now. Bang! There was another noise in the distance, something I wasn't able to put my finger on. Creaking? Crashing? Whatever it may be, it was a clear indication of one thing. Their attempt was successful. I hear catcalling, and more random speeches. I couldn't understand everything that was being said in their chants and cheers, as their slang language was different from the other natives and citizens, but it still sounded so menacing. Swear words, threats, what will happen to our bodies after they've had their way, how many we will each get. Apparently some of them have knives, others have clubs. That much I can at least get a basic gist of. Their voices were getting closer, and then I hear the sound of a woman screaming in fear, then quickly turning into stark agony. I wanted to weep. Weep for the poor soul who, whatever reason, was still out there. It didn't take long for the screaming to finally stop. A few more minutes go by and one of the voices belches out, saying how he successfully cut off a very intimate part of her body and was showing it off. Footsteps. Footsteps were coming closer and closer to our building. 
The way they were moving, it sounded like they were surrounding it. I couldn't help but swear in my breath. If those bastards manage to get in here, I'm going to destroy them the best that I could. Hello, hello. Pretties. Pretties. Come on now, pretties. Open the door. The voice was deep, heavily accented in their standard form. A knock on the door. Might as well get it over with. This time they started kicking one of the doors. The door was shaking dust as it vibrated against the bed that pressed against it. Some of the women yelped in terror. Others were sobbing. Some started swearing and telling them to go away. The thugs continued trying to smash down the door. All the while, a few other members were whisking back and forth and throwing the windows, their peeking shadows dancing inside the walls of our barracks. I ended up hearing some strange scratching sound near my head. No question, one of them was trying to use a knife. The more you try and resist, the more we will mess up your fucking faces after. Saw you in half while you're still alive. I put my hands on my ears, desiring to block out the unsolicited noises and rantings. How long until everything breaks down and they get in here? How many of them are out there anyway? If I were to guess, maybe a minimum of five, maximum of fifteen. Oh, I'm not so sure. My brain is so tired it's hard to think about numbers. I used to be so good at math and philosophy at university, but that was taken away from me too. There was some rustling. I think I heard something about a fire. Shit! Are they going to try and burn us out? Please, please let the guards do something about this. There was some more banging, and a woman screams into her hand as the left clutches her chest, but afterward, the banging eventually ceases and you can hear the footsteps slowly fade away. Are they really giving up? Did we do it? All of us are standing motionless, aware that jumping into conclusions too soon will likely be our own undoing. Some time goes by, I have no idea how much. They could be waiting nearby, hoping we'd let our guard down and tiptoe back outside to investigate. Fat chance. We're standing here for the rest of our night, assholes. Everyone's bodies start to relax a little, and the idea of sleep is finally starting to touch upon us. I stretch out my legs slightly. So that was my first attack. I've been lucky so far, with a few forced prepositions and exchange deals. My head falls back towards the wall and I look up towards the ceiling. A tiny hole was spotted, with a small glimpse of a star in the nighttime sky. Screaming, loud screams once more in the distance, all of us jerk up in shock. The screams are varied and mixed, most of them women, some of them possibly children. One of them appears to be the sound of a young man. Was that their calf? No, they were secret wannabe gang victims, meant for a future meal, so it can't be that. A camp husband who snuck his way in earlier? The screams were louder now, drawn out, absolutely blood-curdling. We heard thumps, screeching, running, and laughter. They got to the other barracks. An older woman speaks in a hushed and solemn tone. We jump up slightly when you hear something being thrown against our outside wall. It was a sickening sound, hard yet wet-sounding at the same time. We were enforced to endure the sound for some time, until finally a dated loudspeaker started to boom across the territory. That's enough now. Stop. You've had your fill. It was a somewhat serious voice, but there was something vaguely casual and nonchalant about it. The horrifying sounds resume. I said ENOUGH! Last names of staff were quickly listed. Go attend to the situation immediately. You can hear some whistles and shouting, followed by the odd gunshot. It was a mix of relief and pure anger over their delay in handling the hell that just transpired. All the commotion, both close by and far off, eventually beginning to die down. The booming voice of the commandant that tells his other men to proceed piling up some of the bodies. Don't worry about burial tonight. We'll wait until morning so the surviving prisoners can do it. I crinkle my nose. My first week here I had to assist in burying hundreds of decomposing bodies in permafrost. It didn't matter if it was warmer outside nowadays. The ground is still impossible to work with. The best that was done was throwing rocks and snow on top of them. My mind quickly shifted to sorrow. I wanted to weep and mourn for everyone, to cry on behalf of the injustice, to tell the world someday. I was exhausted, but sleep was not kind to me that night. Early morning came swiftly, and roll call was carried out. I lined up outside with the other women, groggy and depressed, carefully shifting an eye towards their building. It had scratches and splinters all over it, surprising now that it actually stood up the way it did. I noticed a blotch of blood on the outside the wall, and as my eyes traveled towards the ground, I noticed the torso of a human. The eyes were wide in shock, hands curled up, hair matted with blood, and something stuffed in her mouth. I think I recognized her. A French woman? We met briefly, and I helped her translate something into Estonian and Russian. I darted my head away and closed my eyes. The guards demanded that we scattered and started picking up what needed to be picked up. Here's an old cart, do your duty, then head straight towards the forest, he says. 
Anyone who resists or disobeys is immediately executed, he says. The last threat was a normal one. After it's done, breakfast may be given as usual. I shuffle my way over to a rickety cart, lifting it up slowly and carefully. I push the cart by the usual goners. Ironically, the only ones seemingly untouched by the whole ordeal. Their movements swaying about in a melancholy and eerie motion of nearby. Just nine years and six months to go. Just nine years and six months to go. Just nine years and six months to go. Two years is the average before one perishes. The daily fight for life is fought hour by hour. In my head, I constantly tell myself, this is not the hour that I die.